what we do is um, usually the moments that we have for one another in ministry usually come from uh, moments where something doesn't go quite right and then one of us steps in for the other. Welcome to the Eden Podcast, where we true the verse of Genesis 3.16, and we discover that God didn't curse Eve or Adam or limit woman in any way. This is the Eden Podcast. I'm Bruce C.E. Fleming, Executive Director of the True 316 Foundation. Our website is true316.com. That's tru316.com. And my co-host for today is Joanne Hagemeyer. Joanne, would you take us into the show? Certainly, I'd love to. Uh, we are here this morning. We are here. Whoops. <laughs> okay, let's let's just make a break here. We'll just wait. We'll do it all over again because we don't we don't edit it. So we want to we can cut the end off, but not the middle parts. So let's try it again. Okay. Uh, pa uh, pause. All right. Ready. Welcome to the Eden Podcast. I'm Bruce C.E. Fleming, Executive Director of the True 316 Foundation. Our website is true316.com. That's tru316.com. And we have a special guest today. I'm going to ask my co-host, Joanne Hagemeyer, if you'll take us in there. Thank you, Bruce. We're here with Nick Quint, an interim pastor at the First Baptist Church of Palos Verdes in Greater Los Angeles. He's also a PhD candidate in New Testament at Ridley College in Melbourne, Australia. He is ordained in the American Baptist Churches USA, and he's served in pastoral ministry since 2018. Nick is married to Allison, and he's the father to Nolan. We're glad to have you with us, Nick. Well, thank you both for having me. It's a delight to be here. We, uh, we've we been following each other on Facebook for quite a while. I think I got to know Allison first. How long have you two been married? Oh, goodness, it's it's been... Coming up on 10 years next year. Oh, so no, nine then. years. I haven't known her that long. <laughs> I think she was a, uh, an intern. I, I noticed her on, on Facebook a while back. And so the two of you have had some adventures already. And uh, how old is your little one again? Little one is three years old. Uh, coming out, he's about three in, well, in parentheses, it's, you get it down to the month, but the month escapes me. But he's about, he's, he's, he's closer to four than he is to three. So he's talking to you already. He won't stop. <laughs> that's what the lord wants us to do in prayer just keep talking and not stopping well we'd like to jump in and just find out a little bit about your backstory can you tell us about your faith story how you came to know christ and began to grow in him so it's an interesting story i was raised in a christian home uh, out here i don't know if, if y'all have this in uh minnesota or in the midwest but it's uh carver chapel out here which mm -hmm. is kind of a how do you even describe it? Uh, kind of a dispensational, complementarian, yet charismatic kind of blend of things. Uh, grew up in that, never really cared for it. Uh, never quite, the seeds of faith were there, but they never seemed to grow, so to speak. Parents were wonderful people, loving people. And, uh, you know, it wasn't really until I hit about 18, I, from about 13 to 18, I would have called myself a closet deist of sorts. You know, just kind of a, yeah, there is a thing in the universe that made this. It's some Someone had to flip the switch to get the stew boiling, so to speak. And um, one, once that happens, uh, I basically, when I turned 18, I, I, I wouldn't say I became a Christian, but I, I decided to dedicate my life to Christ. Uh, basically, all right, I've seen all this. None of this works. You know, <laughs> the world doesn't make sense without something, you know, without, without the God of Jesus Christ, basically. And so I decided to go i wanted to be a film major i wanted to write movies when i was when i was younger because you know you have the world at your show you know the world at your fingertips and movies are the great way greatest way to do that right follow your dreams and so i went to biola met my wife there and got bit by the theology bug uh when she was on her way to go to, to trinity uh, evangelical divinity school in, in uh, chicagoland i still stayed behind for a little while to finish up school and then i went to fuller but it was one of those weird experiences that uh had I not met her, I'm not sure where I'd be. And I'm not sure I like all the options that were before me if we take um, take my, at least my sense of where I was going in that. But the Lord was gracious to me and, and far smarter than me and allowed me to marry someone who is far gracious and far more smart than me. And so I fell into pastoral ministry, didn't take a single pastoral ministry class, didn't want to be a pastor, wanted to be an academic, wanted to be a professor or researcher, 
And then the Lord just led me to a church, and then he's kept me in church ever since. And I've discovered that the church is, well, kind of where God likes having people. And so that's kind of where I, how I ended up, where I am today. And so I'm curious get, how you got down to Australia. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, thank God for distance and online and stuff like that. They, they originally, I would have to make a few surgeons out there. Um, yeah, I, I've been following Michael Bird for basically five to 10 years and pestering him online. And I was like, hey, mate, I want to come do a PhD with you. And, you know, did the email thing. We've talked. We met at ETS SBL a few times. And uh, he said, sure, why not? You, you certainly can't be worse than all my other PhD students. And so uh, we decided to go with that. And uh, that's where I, I've been doing that for technically I've been doing that for about five years. But finances, okay. life, all that sort of stuff put a put a pause on a lot of it. So I've only been able to really do it full time as of the start of this year. So first chapter's done. He doesn't hate it. And now it's on to six more chapters or five more chapters. I forget exactly. So. So a PhD is, uh, it means you're supposed to discover things that other people haven't discovered yet. Do you have an idea of what you're going to discover or you haven't got that far yet? Well, uh, uh, basically in, in the world of, of, of post-liberal readings of Paul, you know, the 1970s and on, um, there's not a lot to be discovered uh, historically or linguistically, but there's a lot to be discovered theologically. And so I'm kind of in that space of trying to discern uh, how to put the pieces of these things together in ways that are new or interesting in ways that I don't think have been done. Because usually when you're doing constructive work in theology and New Testament theology and Paul, you kind of let some pieces you don't like or you can't reconcile kind of just sit over there on the shelf and gather dust and you go, with the, you play with the toys you like, not the toys you don't like. And so my mm -hmm. goal is to have all the toys of, of the word of, or at least of Paul say something and then construct a vision out of that. So that's, um, hopefully I'm finding some new things. I've already found a few interesting concepts that I like that I've not seen really argued elsewhere or when they've been argued, they've been argued against what I think is true. And so I'm in, I get to be in the minority, which is fun. I'm kind of enjoying that so far. That's great. So the second step we like to ask is we like to ask you, you know, once you have Christ in your life, he gives you spiritual gifts. And sometimes it's not always obvious. Sometimes it takes a while before the spiritual gifts come out. Uh, it can be professionally used or it can be personally used. Why don't you tell us about your spiritual gifts and then get more into your ministry story? Sure. Um, it's a weird question because I just preached on spiritual gifts in the body of Christ, oh gosh, a couple weeks ago. It feels like forever ago, but it was just a few weeks ago. Uh, told the church, you know, think about that, pray about it. And now that someone asked me it, I'm like, oh, I I, I don't know. <laughs> For myself, I, I don't I don't know. I don't think like that. Um uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting question because I, at the one hand, I, I have a sense of, I don't think of myself in those terms at all. So it's a, it's a foreign question. Not that it's a bad question, but it's a foreign question to my way of thinking. But, uh, I'll tell you what other people have said that way. I'm not getting too much over my own skis. Um, uh, a gift of listening is something I've been told I had from people in ministry, um, able to listen and kind of take in information, kind of see, um, the other thing would be gifts of teaching and stuff like that. Um, and, and an ability, I would hope, so far at least, to be taught as well. I think teachers should be learners as well, lifelong learners. If you want to be a teacher, you should at least learn what you're trying to teach. Mm -hmm. um, I think those two have helped quite a bit. And one of the things uh, that came to bear in pastoral ministry was I was counseling someone who had whose husband had passed away. And this is, you know, rough around the edges kid who still doesn't know anything. I'm still rough around the edges in a kid. I still just know a little less. I know a little more now. Uh, but in that instance, it was one of those moments where I didn't feel I had a word to give to this person. You know, this person's not sobbing or losing their mind, but you know, there is a sense of loss of grief of mourning. And I was like, I don't feel I should say anything. And so contrary to everything screaming in me to say something, I just followed the spirit as, as I discerned it and just kept my mouth shut and just sat there for what felt like an eternity. It was probably only like 15 minutes, but it felt like an eternity. And so um, in that moment, I, I realized that um, sometimes the greatest thing you can do is just don't say a thing. And uh, that's helped in ministry. So oftentimes you get to the root of conflict just by listening. And usually the person will just tell you what the problem is if you just listen long enough. 
Um, not always, but those are some of the things I've, I've noticed um, just in my own life where the Lord has used those, those events and I think gifts to kind of bring clarity in, in situations where I otherwise wouldn't have known what I was doing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you're pastoring. So you find yourself in situations where you're teaching and also needing to listen. Mm-hmm. Very often, every, every day it feels like. Um, one of the fun thing is uh, we, uh, I, I don't know if you've had this experience in church where you, you just say something off the cuff and you kind of just go to move on. And, the, and one person's like, hold on, I've never heard that before. And then the, the rest of the Bible study or the rest of the, the conversation or the rest of the meeting is focused on that. And you're like, oh, there is a deep need in the church for conversation, for focusing on these topics and stuff like that. Um, and those are some things I, I noticed that come up very easily in ministry. Mm-hmm. So one of the things that I wanted to ask you about is, is uh, your interaction with your wife, Allison. And your spiritual gifts. She was an intern when I first noticed her on on Facebook. How how is her ministry going, and how do you guys make room for each other? So she's almost done with her PhD. She's doing it at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland. You know, got a rep. Um, <laughs> she's having a wonderful time with that. She's this close. Um, her ministry is wonderful. It's it's what the Lord has, has gifted her to do. She's. Uh, an adjunct now uh, for Houston Christian University. It was originally Houston Baptist University. And she's been able to use her gifts, clear gifts of, of teaching, clear gifts of, 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 of research and breaking things down so folks can understand it and, and feast on it. You know, um, the word of God is a, is a feast to be, to be enjoyed. Um, she does that. Um, amazing mother. Um, she can preach a mean sermon as well when given the opportunity. Um, uh, gifts of fearlessness, I would say. There's not a lot that scares her. <laughs> not a lot that scares me, but I mean, she's been through, you know, childbirth, PhD, multiple master's degrees, travel, like she, she's, she's run the gamut of, of experiences. Um, what we do is um, usually the moments that we have for one another in ministry usually come from uh, moments where something doesn't go quite right. And then one of us steps in for the other. Like, for example, on church on Sunday, uh, last Sunday, uh, there was a, a hymn I had heard, and I'm used to hearing a hymn a certain way, and we sing from the hymn, you know, the hymnal, and uh, the, the music director plays it. And, you know, we're a small church, so it's not like we can meet and go through this and rehearse all this sort of stuff. We're a very small church. And he plays the song, and I'm like, I do not recognize the tune, and it does not fit with what I'm seeing here. And I don't read music. I'm not, I, I don't read sheet music or anything. And just we're, we're me and the, the, the worship, the singer, or you know, kind of the lead worship leader and him, we're all looking at each other as this is going on. We're like, um, we've all missed each other here. <laughs> just one of those things. And, you know, it's a church of, you know, maybe 20, 25 folks. And we all know each other. So it's not like, you know, we're freaking out or anything. But, you know, I, I look up, does anyone know the tune of how we're supposed to sing this? You know, just because we're Baptist, we can just stop the service. That's what we do. And my wife <laughs> in the back goes, oh, I know the tune. And she's not a, you know, she's not a sing up, sing, be up front kind of person. She can give lectures, but singing, that's not her thing. And that's, of course, one of the, the nightmares you have, the nightmare scenarios, where I'm sure you guys know how this waking up and being like, oh, uh, I get to go in front of a microphone today. Wonderful. And so, but she dropped everything. She ran up and passed Nolan off to me. So I'm sitting here in the front row holding Nolan. He's playing with my microphone and she leads us through the song. And it was just, it was an ordeal. And it's one of those where I was like, you know, there is that issue or that reality of mutual submission but also mutual need from one another and where one is weak in an era the other is strong and uh it just it kind of just clarified for me it's like oh i'm i'm I'm, i am blessed beyond words and uh, thankfully my wife has a sense of humor and i hope would agree with that that's a great story really a great story are you able to go ahead i was going to ask if you're able to collaborate on things I am imagining you read each other's dissertations as they go along, right? Oh, uh, but please. are you able to collaborate on other things? We wrote a, uh, for Priscilla Papers, we did an extended critical review of Wayne Grudem's second edition. I think it's systematic theology. I can't remember if it's Christian theology or systematic theology, you know, the mm. book that thick. Mm-hmm. And we, we did, we talked for hours and hours and hours. We read it independently. I think it was independently of each other. And we said, you know, we can't focus on, it, you know, he's got, you know, it's a, just a massive book, a very well-known complementary author. So it's like, you can't do a massive critique of the whole thing. That's just not appropriate. You know, at that point you're just nitpicking. 
So I chose, I'll focus on his attention to Junia, uh, you know, and, and her ministry, uh, what scripture says and doesn't say. And she focused on subordinationism and eternal generation because Dr. Grudem at ETS had previously denied eternal generation of the son and now affirms it and is using it to affirm his subordinationist view of, of the, in the doctrine of God, where Jesus is subordinate to the father eternally. Which is, a so she, yeah. which is, yes. There's room for some subordination in the incarnation, but no eternal functional subordination. Um, and so Dr. Grudem extends that beyond the incarnation into eternity past where the son has always been subordinate to the father, which is, is, is in my eyes, heretical. Um, so she tackled that and kind of exp went through that, engaged with it, showed that he did not engage very well with alternative authors, alternative explanations, people who are complementarian when it comes to ministry, but not complementarian when the doctrine of God is involved. And so she tackled that. I tackled Dr. Grudem's work on linguistics and and uh, kind of the modern debate about Junia. And um, then we, wrote, she wrote hers, I wrote mine, then we just re rewrote each other's. <laughs> so it's like, it's it, you can see her voice and I'd say about 75% of what she was writing and then you can see my voice in about 75%. But if you look close, there are certain turns of phrases, uh, certain ways she writes that I don't. She's very Germanic, her sentences go on and on and on. Mine tend to have a more of a staccato flourish, you know? And so, but we, we collaborated with that. Um, Thanks, of course, to Mimi Haddad and Jeff Miller for their infinite patience and, and keen editorial eye. But yeah, that was published in Priscilla Papers, oh gosh, maybe a few years ago. I um, can't remember how long it was, but it was an ex we, that was our first major collaboration on uh, together academically that we got peer reviewed and published. And so that it was a mammoth task. Did you learn the uh, things about each other that way? Or were you like we, you knew each other going in? Well, I knew that she writes very long sentences and they can go like like Ephesians one. They just kind of go and go and go and go. Me, I tend not to do that. And so she'll be, I don't think you said enough here. And so I'll go back and tweak and she'll read it. Okay, that sounds about right. Then I'll look at her sentence. I'm like, that's five sentences. I'm like, you got to, <laughs> we, we got to cut this up. And then she said, I don't think, I think you need to go back and reread that section. It sounds like he's actually saying something. And I went back, oh, I misread that, you know, and, you know, it's just, it's, it's, you, you just assume the best of each other. You assume that each other knows what they're talking about, but it never hurts to have an extra set of eyes. And uh, mm -hmm. that was, we, I learned that she is uh, a much, she's more of a, she's much more of a sniper when it comes to writing. So she's very precise, very focused. Whereas me, I'm, I'm more of a, a, a 50 cal machine gun. I just could just kind of keep going. So I could write, you know, the joke is she, she could take, you know, years to write a chapter on her dissertation. Then she wouldn't have to do any edits. Me, I write the thing and then it's just edit the rest of the way. That's kind of how we go. So just personality is different on that, but it's, uh, it helps both of us kind of in our own way. Thank the Lord. I'm, I'm curious how your um, ideas about women in the body of Christ and just women in life were formed, at least from the Christian point of view. Hmm. So I was very, uh, the joke I tell people is I was raised in the kitchen by my mother. My dad had to go out and work and it was, you know, more of a traditional household, but I was raised in the kitchen and I got to see cooking, spices, just the whole, the whole nine yards, you know, very traditional family structure. Um, to this day, I do most of the cooking, not all of it, but most of the cooking. Um, but I was raised around strong women. You know, my mother was a strong woman, um, but very traditional at that time, at least in terms of role, uh, so to speak. Um, it really didn't get, and I, I grew up with kind of an incipient complementarianism, like, you know, I, ironically, the joke I tell people is I wouldn't have been okay with a woman pastor, wouldn't have, I am okay now. Um, but the idea of hierarchy and marriage didn't make sense to me because I didn't really see it work. You know, just, I'm not talking theological, I'm just talking, you know, just by instinct. So I would have been more egalitarian in the home and more complementarian in the church. Um, but it wouldn't have been because of any disdain for, liber quote, liberalism or that liberal reaction. It was more just a personal, uh, that just doesn't seem right, or that's just not my experience. It's not wrong, I just... It's not for me, you know, it's a taste thing. Um, then I met my wife and she basically was like, well, I feel called to ministry. I feel called to teach and do all that. Don't feel called to be pastor. Um, but she was egalitarian at the time and said, if we're gonna date and be together, you need to figure out what you believe on that because people are gonna look at you and you're gonna be, you know, she's like, I get slings and arrows. You're gonna get slings and arrows because, you know, you gotta figure that out. So, like, okay. So I took Ron Pierce's Theology of Gender Class at Biola. Mm -hmm. and came out of that, I wouldn't say fully convinced of egalitarianism, but my film background helped a little because you know you, you have to know narrative and structure and beats and plot and all that sort of stuff. So I just went and read Genesis and I was like, oh yeah, there, there's nothing hierarchical about this. 
And if this is where the story began, and this is what God desires for all of creation, in fact, that's where we're going, you know, or at least that's what he's pulling us back to, then Paul can't be saying what he's saying in 1 Timothy. Like, it, it, I just, there's no room in my brain then and now for Paul cannot, Paul, this is his scripture. He's not going to just blatantly find something that is not in the text. You know, he's, he's not a modern eisegetical theologian. And so, um, yeah, basically from that point on, uh, read Philip Payne, have critiques of some of his work, but I, he, he solidified my view of, of 1 Corinthians 11 and the kind of the difficult passages. Um, and it was just, at that point, it was just a steady process for about 10, so actually no, from about 2009, I think is when we met. So from about 2009 to the present day, um, just been reading on it. And I would say fully egalitarian, probably about six months to a year after Ron Pierce's um, class. Um, the only issue was I couldn't figure out 1 Timothy 2, but I'm like, well, I'm not going to reinterpret every single text in light of a single text that was taught to me first year Bible. That's how, you know, that's how you get Arianism. You know, that's how you get all sorts of things that are very easy. And so um, that was kind of my sense of it. And then, and then just meeting women in ministry that serving good conservative evangelical, wonderful women gifted by God um, that were not crazy, <laughs> you know, because then I was told, you know, because when the debate comes up, I'm sure you all know this. You know, oh, it's, these are the pink-haired, crazy people that hate, you know, hate men. And I'm like, I, I, I know her. She's at the assemblies of God's church. They're way more conservative than I am. <laughs> You're telling me she's a crazy loon bag? No, I don't buy this. And so it's just one of those things. I think just the end of the day for me it was trying to treat people as individuals, trying to understand that the spirit of God does work. Um, and then unless there's ethical lapses or issues, then the spirit of God calls. And then we move in basis with the spirit of God on that. Or to the best of our ability, of course, as human beings. We, we had a delightful interview with Ron Pierce at the beginning of season 12 on the Eden podcast. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wish I'd gotten to know him a lot earlier because we have a lot of uh, common uh, ideas and thoughts together. He spoke no. at my ordination, which is a very, very happy thing for me. He read scripture for us. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. So your church in Palos Verdes, is that is that like a, a startup or is that an established church and do they share where you are so it's been around gosh 50 plus years 60 years it's been in the community for a long time um and as with most churches it seems unless you're a mega church uh kind of starts off and kind of just tapers mm -hmm. down a bit um i would say i mean based on what i've preached and i know the elders and we have a woman elder as well um my sense is the elders are on board in fact we had that conversation are you are okay with women in ministry the previous pastor uh or rather i should say previous pastors that were at least were undecided on the question of women in ministry technically our, our denomination the american baptist churches usa is egalitarian mm -hmm. in policy but we're also baptist which means that's ultimately a decision for the local church and so you do have churches that dissent or, or are complementarian um, I'd say most churches in our region tend to be either soft complementarian or soft egalitarian. There's not a whole, there's, there's not a lot of fanaticism around that. You got a few churches either way that are kind of crazy, you know, but most churches kind of occupy the soft center of that and make room for others and stuff. Um, but no, the, I think the church by and large is, I would say egalitarian friendly or sympathetic. Um, I preached, I plan on preaching through 1 Timothy if they keep me on as pastor, I plan on preaching through 1 Timothy over the next year which will be fun after we finish baptism um but yeah it's it, i i think by and large i mean i preached on mary you know mary's you know the birth of jesus and how um jesus as, or i should say as D the fact that joseph's put aside even though the lineage of david comes through him uh tells us that god stands essentially in judgment of david's sins but also recognizes the history of israel in david and stuff and so it's kind of a uh, an interesting way of kind of bypassing the, you might say, the, uh, the the legacy of sin and mankind and God dealing with woman and dealing with that and through redemption of all of humanity, as John says, the Lamb of God comes and takes away the sins of the world. And you only get that through Mary. You don't get that through Joseph. And so mm -hmm. I'm very influenced by T.F. Torrance and some of the old school reform theologians that are very conservative, but recognize that um, when Jesus came into the world through the incarnation, that is a great egalitarian act. And so I uh, I think the church was, is and was very receptive to it. Um, and, you know, there's always people that disagree, and that's fine. We're Baptists. It's Baptist is Greek for we disagree. But, um, <laughs> but I've never heard that. <laughs> I may repeat it. <laughs> as long as you are submitted to one another and living in reverence to one another and respecting the opinions of others in a way that builds them up, um, there's a lot of room at, at the table, and at least at this church. And so it's a, it's a fun church to be at. Small but full of people who love each other.
So my, yeah, my wife, Joy, good. and I share a similar experience. We both worked on our doctorates at the same time, and we would share what we what we did. Um, I was off on a different topic, totally non-biblical. It was contextualization in Africa, and my papers were stolen when we moved down to Africa, so I had to, to pivot. And we had done a we had been invited in Strasbourg, France, to do a series of uh, monthly workshops. And Joy had done Genesis two and then Genesis three, and they asked her to do Ephesians and then First Timothy. And she said, uh, "Go to Bruce on that." <laughs> so I I hadn't planned to do that, but I ended up doing it. And so what I found in Joy's study of Genesis two and three is there's a giant bell curve in Genesis two and Genesis three, a chiasm. And the center of most chiasms is the main idea. And then when I was studying First Timothy, I found that he did the same thing. He pulled out, he did the same kind of a chiastic structure, which gave me a lot of insight into what I was doing. So it's nice to, you know, how you can enrich each other, the, the husband and the wife. Uh, mm-hmm. Well, Bruce, that also turned into book number four. No, that was three. No, book number three. Number three. Book yeah. number three, yeah. which you might find intriguing, Nick, since you're going to be preaching through First Timothy. You might find book number three pretty intriguing. Some ideas that you may not have seen before. Okay, I'll look it up. Time for a commercial. Yes, it's called Back to Eden, First Timothy. And actually, uh, I found that that Paul gave an outline in advance many times. He would say, this is what I'm going to talk about. And so... Uh, he, and then there was another structure in the book of First Timothy. He talks about himself. He talks about the wayward pastors being corrected. Then he talks about Timothy. And the, the, the difficult passages are in that middle section. So somebody asked us in a Zoom session. We do a, a Zoom session, a Q&A, the first Saturday of every month. And they said, I've been doing word studies, and it's not been helping me. And I said, well, yeah, the, in these difficult passages, word studies are helpful. But the literary patterns also convey meaning in Hebrew and in and in Greek. So when you look at the literary patterns in First Timothy, you go, oh, okay, I understand now that the key verse is First Timothy chapter three, verse one. But I hadn't read that anyplace else before I started overlaying Joyce pattern and, and understanding it that way. So yeah, that, that'll be fun. I'd like to see what you come up with too. Yeah, me too. We'll have to see what I come up with. <laughs> <laughs> do you put do you put your sermons on YouTube? Can we look at it sometime? We do, yeah. Uh, just FBC Palace Verdes, I think, is what it is. Uh, the whole service is up there, so you get you get worship uh, through one microphone. So we're we're still figuring that out, but yeah, but yeah that's all there. Yeah, so I, I'll have to figure out how because one thing is, as you know, Bible study is where all the fun technical stuff happens, and you get to the the pulpit, and it's like. Yeah, the, the, the pulpit is not for technicality, although I, I try to, I don't hide it, but it's one of those where it's like, this is a sermon, not a lecture, and it's it's always so tempting. It's always Yeah, so you can't say that. There's three possibilities for this verse. <laughs> you know, when you preach it, you have to say, I hear, you know, thus saith the Lord, and let's let's exactly. roll with it. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's a lot of fun, too, as we try to discern. Now, I was curious, had you come across the True 316 ministry, and, and do you think there's any future in it? Uh, so I, I know it through you just because we're we're f- Facebook friends and social media buds. Uh, one of the things I, I really liked was um, uh, just the, I think in, in most of Christian theology goes right or wrong, depending on how you read Genesis. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's something I've been pushing. Uh, we, I've been, we've been going through scripture and ethics for today at church, right? And kind of our Wednesday night. And so I decided, you know, in order to understand ethics at all in court in a christian sense is we got to read genesis because that's the beginning of the story this tells us how the world was originally ordered to be or created or structured to be and so starting with genesis 1 genesis 2 male and female cultivation made in the image of god and all of that um i think most the- theology does not start with genesis and i think um by you focusing us on that kind of paradigm and the chiasm i i didn't know about the chiasm i'm not surprised by that uh, that doesn't surprise me at all, but I, I was unaware of it. That's some really helpful knowledge. Um, I think if you get Genesis right, then a lot of Christian theology and, and Paul and women specifically becomes very intelligible. And the, the so-called weird or difficult texts become at least more... People can at least see the, the logic when the logic, of course, is dead to us, right? It's not, we don't think this way. So I think y'all's work in that, I think, is, is incredibly valuable. It's just kind of re-highlighting the original intent of creation 
and not basically, well, how does Paul interpret it? It's like, well, yes, we need to understand how Paul interpreted it. That's vital for understanding it. But you're not going to understand how Paul interprets something unless you know what he's interpreting. And so I think kind of getting us back to the sources of, of the beginnings of Christian theology is very vital. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, we've got to stop here, but we're going to keep in touch with you, Nick, and with Allison, too. And uh, we'd like to see the latest updates when we find out what you've written in your dissertations. And in the spinoffs, Joy came back from Africa uh, with a 407-page dissertation. And people said, oh, that's that's really nice. <laughs> but I don't think I'm going to get through all 407 pages. So Kathy Krager and, and uh, Alvira Michelson came to her and said, would you condense that? So mm-hmm. she did. And so that's one of the joys that we have is to be able to share that book uh, in English, and it's just coming out in French too. So we're we're looking forward to, looking forward to that coming up. Well, we've been listening to Nick and Joanne and Bruce on the Eden Podcast, and we thank you for for joining us today. True Three Sixteen Foundation is the home of the Eden Podcast. Join us for three dollars and sixteen cents a month or more. Let's chew the verses on the key passages on women and men. Go to true three sixteen dot com slash partner. True 316 is strengthening and encouraging many, and we're getting stories every day of lives changed through our ministry. We're the home of the Eden Podcast, and we're getting the word out that God didn't curse Eve, or Adam, or limit woman in any way. Our volunteer help is wonderful, and we grow stronger with each new true partner who gives to the True 316 Foundation so that we can cover the costs to do the technical work of the Eden Podcast, to coordinate our true school workshops like the two-week Eden workshop on Genesis 2 and 3, and to make the True 316 Foundation function in its outreach to scholars and students around the world. You can give now with a one-time gift. And better still, you can join now and become a monthly donor. We call our monthly donors our true partners. Please join now by going to true316.com partner.